Here we go. We are live. Yes, let me line my camera up correctly. Hello, everyone. We have zero viewers right now, but usually we'll get a couple. Um. Oh, shoot. It's not showing up. Let me double check. I got did this right. Uh, okay. Oh, you know what? I probably have the wrong output on Discord. Let me just... It's probably set to just internal. Come on. Come on. Everything's running slow because I have the streaming software going. Yep, yep, that is the wrong output. It should be this one. And this should be like that. Is that working now? Yes. Yes, now they can hear you. Cool. Hello. Hello. There's a lot of background noise in your end. Sorry, I was drinking a smoothie. My doctor says that I should drink smoothies, so. It's a lot of vitamins. And, like, more fiber than juice, so. Or it works. Yeah, it's true. You gotta actually set it to play with friends if you wanna play with friends. Stuff. Uh, there you are. Alright. We're in the room. Railroad ink. Warming up with some railroad ink. Let's see. Expansion. Uh, let's try the river expansion. Let's see how that works out. All right, everybody's set to start. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, cool. It's on um, iOS now. Okay. Hmm. Should look into getting that. The uh, if anyone watching hasn't, um, rather, no, it's too late. The Kickstarter for the Oink Games app, which is, like, gonna have startups and Deep Sea Adventure, which are both pretty fun games, uh, they just went into beta, but you can only get into that if you're in the Kickstarter, and nobody's ever online on there, which is frustrating, because I want to play against real people, but the only ones that are there are the, like, bot. Mm. That's right. annoying. All right, here we go. So now we have special river dice along with the regular dice. And I believe the rivers work pretty much the same as like the the roads and the others. It's basically adding like a third a third option. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Right, this is how you play this game. There we go. Um, yeah, you have to put them all in. I'll never okay. forget. <laughs> it really has been a while since I played this. Um, <laughs> hmm. Uh, river up there. Yeah. That sounds right. Mm. There we go. Locked in. Let's see. Yeah, Let's I think I messed something did. up, but this one in the corner was an accident, and then I was just too lazy to un re like undo it. I guess I couldn't do it. Um, that would look. Yeah, some of them you can. <laughs> some of the board game arena games you can undo. Other ones they don't even give you that option. Targi is the, the worst for that. Rude. Like, as soon as you try and do something, you're locked in. Oh, done. Done. Oh. Alright. Okay. Oh, the rivers do turn. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Let's see. Am I allowed to put it there? I am allowed to. really appreciate Board Game Arena for um, just 
not taking up too many resources. Like, I, I use stuff like Tabletop Simulator, which is great, and it has, like, a ton of games, but it's, like, a full 3D simulation of, like, a physical copy of the game, so it takes up, like, so much CPU, and your computer just has to chug to use it, so trying to do, do that while streaming it, if my computer could not handle that. Oh, yeah. I like, I like this. I like just having it in HTML, you just click it, it updates, and you can just, like, leave and come back after a while, and just, like, take your turn whenever. That's, that's the ideal. The chess by oh. mail model. Yeah, I feel like I like this uh, format for playing it a lot better than the other one, because I feel like we had to do something weird with the last one where we had to, like, set all the... Like, you couldn't just place the dice on the board. You had to, like, set them specifically, like, in a spot. And I don't know. It just yeah. Doesn't, it didn't work as well. Well, that, yeah, that's the thing, is that that, that uh, Tabletopia, that's pretty much what Tabletop Simulator is. And so, it, in the same way, it's basically they just make the game in 3D, and they're just like, okay, just like move it around and play it like you were really there. But that ends up being so slow and clunky, whereas this, you can, um, you can just like, it, it sets up most of it for you, and it handles all the little busy work stuff. Which, in a lot of ways, makes it a little nicer than, um, than even, uh, real, real, uh, board gaming. Because you don't have to do all the little busy work things of, like, keeping track of scores or, like, adjusting here or there. Yeah. Okay. That oh, it keeps, it's keeping our score in real time. Oh, that's weird. Look like in the line above on your scorecard. Apparently, you have a negative one. I don't know how that happened already. I'm not doing great. <laughs> I am not doing great. I think the rivers like threw me a lot more than I had anticipated that they were going to. Yeah, I'm not fully sure how they work. <laughs> I think there might be like some quirk to them that I, I don't it know. Just, it just let me put one in like a random spot, so that seems weird, but whatever. I'll take it. Yeah. I think technically you can just drop... Mm, no, I guess not. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. It's very odd. Yeah. Oh, well. I don't really care if I lose. I'm just playing around. Yeah, know? exactly. It's like, oh, you don't even necessarily have I'm to... I'm figuring it out. It's weird. Yeah, it's super weird. You watch that one um, where he reviews all of the expansions of this, all 28 of them. I haven't yet. I just remembered it this morning. Um, yeah, but there's I don't like know what's going on. there's also, like one like, that's like Pac-Man where you gotta draw the ghosts and the Pac-Man and the dots. There's one where it's like little aliens, so you gotta put like cows and UFOs picking up the cows. All sorts what? of cute stuff. What? I love that. Yeah. There's a Tetris one where you have to, like, build all of the squares on the board into Tetris shapes. And done. I think it also doesn't help that it's been so long since I've played any form of Railroad Inc. that I kind of forget how the base game even works. Yeah. Remember, you get points for all of the squares in the middle that you cover, so I'm kind of just focusing on that. Oh, yeah! That's a good point. Yes. Uh, whoops. Well, I immediately screwed myself over with that plan. Oh, boy. I, I 
think it's like you get a point for every one of those middle nine squares and you get like points for your longest road and your longest railroad. I think. Mm -hmm. It always says it down here in uh, the place section. What's, what's this? Oh, that just opens up the book. I may as well. Around five of six. Oh no, we're almost done. It's so fast. It's very fast. I feel like we're really zooming through it though. That's true. Yeah, it would be a little slower in person because you have to actually draw it all. The cards are like um, paper or like you can get a version where they're like little whiteboards that you have to draw on with dry erase. Dang. So that would take a little bit longer but it's just kind of kind of relaxed. There's another one, uh, what's it called, String Railway, where you're basically like making a railway network out of like pieces of string on a table. Mm. That one it seems very relaxed. I didn't use my river pieces, crap. Mm. Oh, do we not have to use the river? No, uh, we do. I okay. Think, yeah, I just forgot. Uh, okay. There. are a third kind of route, sort of. They can't be used to connect exits, but they can be connected to each other to create a river. They can't be crossed by highways. Uh, da -da -da. Okay, you don't have to draw any of the rivers if you don't want to. Oh. <laughs> they don't have to be connected. You can't connect them with other kinds of routes. Uh... When checking for errors, right, you lose points for every thing that doesn't connect. I remember that now. Each end of a river that does not connect to another river or the outer edge of the board counts as an error. At the end of the game, choose one river. Oh boy. Then you gain one point for each space of that river. If both of them are connected to the outer edge, you get three more points. And then, yeah, I guess the six rounds is a specific, a specifically river expansion thing. There's also the mm -hmm. lake expansion. Oh. I a little bit wish that I had known about the river rules before I just started going for it, but also it was like, it's kind of an exciting way to try to figure it out. True, yeah. At least now you know why they're doing that, so that's something. Yeah. And there's also the lakes, which like, can connect different routes with piers. Hmm. I think we'll try that in the, this next round, since we're going through this one so quick. Let's see. River. River. No. No, I can't put the river there. No. Yeah, I have 17 errors. I definitely am not going to be able to fill those in by the end of this. No, I... I don't know what happened. Things just got wild. I completely forgot how to play this game.
done. It's from the reverse in the end. Oh, I won. I guess 29 wow. to 24. I'm so surprised. Let's see what. Let's see. connecting exits. You had twice as many connected exits as I did. I had more expansion points. I had more errors. I definitely didn't help. Okay. Let's. I'm gonna set, reset it so that we can play the lakes expansion. Cool. So, look at how that works. Hmm. So, once again, you don't have to draw lakes. Uh, you don't need to be connected to the pre existing routes. If the space has three sides adjacent to the open sides of lakes, it must be completely filled with water immediately. Okay. Open lake sides do not count as errors. Networks connected oh. to the same lake are connected to each other. And you get one point for each space occupied by your smallest lake. Points. I gotta get my board game arena ranking up. Play with the pros. Oh, right, because we just finished the game. It always gives me a notification when a game ends. It's like, generally I know already, so... Everything should be good. Did you get your the uh, invite? Mm -hmm. I accept. Yes. Now to the lakes. It's, Open. it's a peach secret. I went and got a bunch of peaches yesterday. I'm living my best peach life. Um, yeah. That, there's so much peach stuff down here. Because, I mean, it's Georgia. So... Oh it's yeah, like, you're in Georgia! <laughs> that's like the, the meme fruit for the state, but it's like... I've never been a huge fan of peach drinks. They always just seem a little too, like, sticky. I don't know. I like nectars. I'm not really into nectar drinks. Mm. No, me either. Too thick. Ugh, and sweet. I'm saying, yeah. Mango, I have the same problem with, like, mango in general. It's just, it's just kind of a, it's kind of like a, a sticky, stickiness. I don't, I don't like too much. I got into eating them with the skin on for a while, and that I really liked because you could, yeah, avoid, like, that's the, that's the hard thing. Even with, like, peaches, like, sometimes it's too much for me. I have to, like, slice them up and eat it with a fork. But, um... Yeah, mango is hard. I was super into mangoes a few years ago, and I haven't really eaten them since. I, like, really overdid it. Mm. I think I've gotten that way with avocado right now. Because, like, they're super cheap mm. down here. It's, like, 68 cents an avocado. Um, oh, yeah, I remember you saying that. Yeah, because, oh, I mean, gosh. like, we get them from Florida, so it's, like... They're super cheap, but then it's also, like, they're so annoying, because they, they, like, take a while to be ripe, and then when they hit ripeness, they're only good for, like, a couple days, maybe, like, a few more if you put them in the fridge, but then, I don't know, I just, like, I, I've, I just ate them so much that I've gotten kind of, not, not sick of them, but, like, bored. Mm-hmm. I definitely get that. I haven't eaten them in ages. Well, I couldn't eat them for a minute because of my, like, ass reflux thing or whatever, but now I can probably stomach it again, but I'm...
I'm just not interested. I feel like I like you see it's avocado so frequently, but it's a lot. Like it's a lot for the stomach. I think it's a lot. It's also like so fatty, which I feel like is why it's so popular because it, it's natural fats and people will just crave that but then like it's like a lot of fat though it like really kind of weighs you down at a certain point mm -hmm. yeah absolutely agreed myself up. I wasn't paying attention to the routes coming out of these uh, lakes. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, oh, nope. I got one of the bridges. Perfect. I also keep forgetting there's the special routes that you can only use once a game, but you can use at any time. I didn't, yeah, I didn't use them at all last time. I always just forget they're there because they're like tucked way up up top. I might have to use some in this game. I'm already setting myself up for some failure. made a very tiny lake on the left there. I know. That'll get you two points at the end for your smallest lake. Cute. I can respect a small lake. Mm -hmm. One other thing I really like about Board Game Arena is um, if you hover over with your mouse over a lot of things, it'll just like pop up and explain what that is. So if you hover over the little scoring boxes above your board, it'll tell you what that score is for. Mm -hmm. Which is it's definitely useful in a game like this where most of it is just scoring. Yeah. Like, roll and rights in general, is ba it's basically just setting, is like, randomizing a score pad in the, the most strategic way you can think of. It was actually, I don't know if it's still around, but um, there was a, a website where you could play basically Yahtzee in HTML, and... You would play it, and then the computer would analyze how you played it, and it would tell you at the end, like, how optimally you played Yahtzee. So it basically would tell you how good you were at Yahtzee. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I'd be curious to see that implementation for some other stuff. Um, but I don't know what other games would be set. I guess Tic-Tac-Toe? There was like another one that, oh, yeah. um, where it was like you would play rock paper scissors against a computer, and it would basically analyze how you randomized, and it would eventually be able to predict exactly what you were going to go for. It would figure out what your personal algorithm is, basically. Oh, that's really cool, and yeah. also like kind of, I don't know, freaky. Yeah, I mean, human, that's the big thing, is that humans are just kind of bad at randomizing, specifically. Like, we're really good at building heuristics, but when it comes to things like randomizing or, like, quick math, we're ill-equipped compared to a computer. Mm hmm But we don't think that we are. Yeah. We've got a real superiority complex as a species. Yeah. This is why I advocate for robot rights. Robots are so disrespected. <laughs> and right now we're like, oh, what are they going to do, fight back? It's like, not right now, but they'll look back and see what we were doing to robots and be, they'll give us the side eye. 
Oh, certainly. I like I feel like the lakes is just easier for me to kind of like conceptualize but it's hard to say because um I just didn't know what I was doing with the rivers so yeah yeah it helps a little bit to have actually read the rules <laughs> before starting <laughs> that's a lot of games you know if you know the rules it's a it's a much easier game mm. but I was just talking about how uh, or with someone about how I kind of enjoy playing games with no agreed upon rules mm. in that like um, I don't know that just kind of like arise organically because I think it's a really interesting way to observe the like function of communication Calvin Ball um, basically yeah yeah because it's like you're both playing and you're coming to some sort of agreement as to like what is happening between you, but you both probably have very different conceptualizations of like the rules that you're, the parameters with which, in which you're actually playing, which is like kind of just how people communicate anyway. Like we can only like actually be understood to a certain extent, like. Yeah. So I just think it's really fascinating. I, I think that's a large reason for why um, people find board games a little, uh, um, harder to, like, break into in terms of, like, gaming. Uh, because someone pointed it out, with video games, it's a little easier because you can write into the code what the walls are, what the borders to all of the different rules are. Like, you can jump so high. If you hit this button, you'll, like, scoot forward this amount. So just by playing it, even if the game doesn't explain itself, if you just hit buttons, you'll eventually start to understand how it works. But with board games, you have mm -hmm. the infinite, like, universe, effectively. Like, it'll generally be bounded to what's going to fit in the box, what's going to be on the table, but, like, you can do anything with the stuff on the table, and most of it would be stuff that's not even involved in the game. So, to understand the, the rules and the borders of the game, you have to, like, have someone teach you, or specifically have someone there to let you know if you did something wrong. So, right. uh, I, I like that idea of like, nothing's specifically wrong, but it's different to what is the, the concept that was working in the other person's, um, model of what you were doing. Yeah. And then I think, I guess the, like, there's just like so much improvisation there, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which is like a lot of the fun of it. Yeah. I think that's something, um, I've been trying to put together this video, um, basic the idea being it's like a house flipping show but for board games so starting with all the oh, classic that's cool. crappy board games specifically monopoly is the one i'm working on first and i was talking with some people about like why do people like monopoly and one person pointed out it's like monopoly's fun when you don't know the rules and you're basically just turning into a sandbox and you're just doing whatever you want with the pieces oh that's a really good point Right? Because what, what do you do when you, like, most people don't learn Monopoly by actually reading the rules. They learn because their parents or some older family member teaches them Monopoly, and that person might not have actually known what the rules were. So it becomes almost like an oral tradition, the way that games like Tag are. Right. So, like, it's similar to, like the, like, the free parking rule. It's, like, it's just adding a lottery to the game, which is mm -hmm. actually not a great idea because it makes it la take a lot longer, but it adds a lot of excitement to the game. Right. Well, and there's a lot of, like, malleability in that, too. And it's interesting because, because like, because you could then, like, add really whatever rules or play it in whatever way, like, you want to at that point. And, like, when you play it with different people, like there's the the exchange of like oh how do you play like you have to it's like a game that everyone plays a little bit differently i think um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so there's like so such a wide array of rules and ways that it can be played yeah or i don't know like you and i when we were kids like we're really like to just like play games and make up our own rules to add into them 
Because I think, like, there's the fun in that, too. But again, like, also, like, we didn't often, like, talk about the rules. We just, like, continued, we just had a lot of ideas and implemented them as we saw fit. Exactly. Um, which is why which I think... worked and didn't work, but... Stuff like tabletop RPGs are pretty, um, pretty popular now because people like to be able to, like, come up with their own stories and everything. And then also, I, I feel like that's where most variations, like, you'll see, um, like, rummy or trick-taking games, where it's a family of card games that are all mostly the same, but they have different variations, and when you actually go back and look at it, those variations are almost always based on region where someone mm -hmm. someone like went out of town and played it with someone else and they learned this game and then they brought it back to their town but they didn't remember the rules entirely and they kind of adjusted so over time there were all of these variations of rummy like gin rummy and straight rummy and shanghai and such that evolved right. out of that just oral way of learning games mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's cool to see people, I feel like, games coming, like, more into the mainstream. Um, especially for, like, adults. Because uh, I feel like play is so important and we, like, really overlook that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, a lot of pe the reason that, you know, play has become so much bigger now is because uh, with our current, like, um, with the way that our current economy is, a lot of people are trying to retreat into childhood, so a lot of people are a lot more focused on things, the nostalgic things of childhood, like gaming, which means that games, which used to be like a very niche thing of like making game, board games or playing them or like video games or whatever, now mm -hmm. it's like so many people that grew up with it want to be able to work in that, that we've had a huge boom of new games a lot of which are not great, but especially with Kickstarter and stuff, people are still able to get it out there and they'll still get somebody to play it. So overall, I think that that's a net good. Like that's a net positive, even if the games themselves are like only a handful of them are going to actually be good ones that probably stand the test of time. The fact that people were able to express themselves in that way and actually get it out to a wide audience is... Uh, is still a pretty cool thing. Mm-hmm. I agree. I'm gonna decide if I should use one of these special routes. I just used one. It felt very empowering. Do it. <laughs> yeah, witch. Mmm. Mmm. The problem is they all have three open ends, so if I'm not able to close them off, it's gonna be a lot of points I lose. Ah! Oh no! My, my monitor has been, um, powering down by itself. A lot lately. Oh. I think it's dying. Oh yeah. no. Hold on, let me see if I can get it back on. Nope, nope. Well, that's fine. I can play it. <laughs> I can play it through the OBS screen on my other screen. Hold on. Let me see if I can. Yep, yep. I can see it. Uh, there. Oh no, the done is like cropped off. Okay, there it is. I could not see. Oh boy. Oh! There we go, monitor's back up. Yeah, I guess I just need to replace this, or like, plug it into a different outlet or something. It just keeps like, power cycling all the time. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very That's stressful. Stressful. I think I also I'm like kind have... of at a place. Hmm? I'm like kind of at a place in this game right now where I like, don't know where to put things. I mean, I this guess is the last the end round. is like not a bad place to find that myself in that position, but yeah. Hey, there goes the monitor again. Oh, well. I can I can see from another screen. Let's see this. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you hear that? Uh, Idris, Idris Elba is gonna play Knuckles in the new song movie. Absolutely, I heard that, and. It's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be very different for Knuckles, but that that matches. It's a lot of people have pointed yeah, out I'm... that like Knuckles, despite being a non-human character, has clearly always been black coated. So, mm -hmm. I, I think that's a very good fit, and he was really good in the Suicide yeah, Squad. Yeah, I'm not opposed. 
I guess I was just, uh, I feel like, I don't know, maybe my brain just typecasted him into, like, a more serious, like, action-oriented star than he is. But I guess he was in, like, Cats. But, uh, yeah, yeah. I just saw that Suicide Squad, actually. Have you seen it? Yeah, I just saw it. Oh, what'd you think? Um, I appreciated. I I know that it's like a too to sleep violent, and like that's something that people don't love about it. But like, I actually appreciate it for that. I I appreciate a comic book movie that like doesn't hold itself back because I because I feel like that's like a problem that I have with a lot of the Marvel Marvel films is they feel so watered down to me. It takes out some of the enjoyment. But um, I felt like the writing wasn't great. I felt I just felt like. The, the I like I never really felt connected to the characters or like their camaraderie really felt real to me. Um, and there were okay. moments that I was like genuinely bored, but there were also moments that I like really enjoyed. So it wasn't like I don't know. It was fine. I yeah. I my, liked it a lot more than the other one. <laughs> I, I recorded my my like YouTube review of it, but like I uh, my my only real issue with with it was that James Gunn's like comedy dialogue isn't always great um i Mm -hmm. my my big thing is and this is a problem i have with quite a few um different dc movies but like harley quinn like i get it she's the fan favorite but like anytime she shows up i want her to be the harley quinn from the animated series from the 90s like that's Mm -hmm. the harley quinn i want and the only time they've really done that with this Margot Robbie Harley Quinn was in Birds of Prey. Which was so good. Which was so but good. Yeah. That one gets so little credit for being probably one of the best DC movies, like between that and Shazam. I, I never saw Shazam, but I heard really good things about it. I should, oh, it's I should very watch good. It. But yeah, I love Birds of Prey. I watch it like every couple weeks, probably. Yeah, no, it's, it's very good. And I feel like it's my... It's my favorite characterization of a lot of those characters. Hey, I win. I win at Lakes. Oh, it was very close Winner. this time, though. Very close. Hey, yeah. that's my first victory in Real Road. That was fun. I like the oh, Lakes yeah. expansion. Um, yeah. That one was pretty good. Yeah, I feel like there was the, like, one moment where they kind of got there when she, like... Well, I guess, like, spoilers. But do you know what I'm talking about in Suicide Squad? When, with the, like guy i don't want to like sure. give anything away but oh with the the el presidente yeah 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 she got to uh, have like a big moment which was which was good and like all of the characters by themselves were still like I, that's a big thing i did like about it was that all of the characters had better characterization than pretty much any of the main roster justice league characters and honestly better characterization than like a lot of current movies yeah that was as individuals i did enjoy them a lot but like i it just like didn't work together i don't know i just like yeah the the their interactions weren't enough for me to like believe that yeah, well, that's also the thing is that they split up so much throughout the movie. To the to people have made the criticism that it feels Harley Quinn feels kind of tacked on by her being apart from the squad for most of the movie. But at the same time, I don't know. That feels so much more comic book to me. Like in comic books, that's usually what would happen. Like, I, I think the best thing I heard was someone said like this feels like an event comic book like this feels like a mini series you get one issue at a time like with you know characters splitting off and doing their own thing and all the characters getting their own little moments and everything like it it, it definitely had the that feeling in a way a lot of these comic book movies don't mm-hmm. yeah I agree yeah um Yeah, I don't know. It's, like, definitely... I wouldn't watch it again, just for me personally, but I did like it... Yeah. ...more than, like, I've enjoyed most Marvel movies, but it wasn't, like, the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I can... Yeah, that definitely sounds like a pretty reasonable, um... 
assessment. That's the word. Have you seen old yet? No, I watched a review of it and was like pretty disturbed. Well, it wasn't even a review. It was just a synopsis and was pretty disturbed by it. So I think I like this. I'm not really interested, which sucks because I like actually did want to see it. Um, I I would say it's better to track down. In fact, I could just link you um, to the graphic novel it's based on because it is by and large okay. a lot better than the movie ended up being. Mm-hmm. And it's only like a hundred pages. Well, that's how I felt about. I find that, like, graphic novel adaptations at this point in my life, or, like, comic ad- adaptations, the comic is just, like, or the graphic novel is just, like, thematically so much more impactful. Excuse me. Um, that, I don't know. Adaptations are such a tricky thing, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult, I would say... It's definitely been done a lot better than it was in old. Um, Because, like, the the larger thing is that the parts that were adapted from the the graphic novel were a great deal better um, than the parts that he added on top of that. Uh, One of the larger things that I found frustrating, and this isn't... This isn't a spoiler, but, like... In the graphic novel, they don't explain why they get old, because that's not the point. It's a, it's subtext about growing old that you can relate to, like, mm-hmm. as a person. Whereas in the movie, uh, M. Night took the time and felt the need to actually explain, well, why is this happening? And it's like, it's not, that's not the point, but it's on. Yeah, that's like the big complaint that I have about most um like <laughs> I was just talking about creepypasta again because I always get there but like that's like a complaint I have about most like creepypasta and a lot of horror now like people get so like um wrapped up in like explanation and the details that I think it takes a lot of the like horror out of it um Specifically, like, I'm talking about the back rooms. I went down a back rooms rabbit hole a few months ago, and um, it's, like, interesting at first, but then, like, the lore is supposedly that nobody's ever made it out of the back rooms, but then they can, like, describe to you every single, what happens at every single level, and each one is more dangerous than the next, but also not dangerous. Um, And it's just, like, I understand that it's... uh, The back rooms are, like... Um, the back rooms are like this essentially like liminal space that people like no clip into it's 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 like based a lot on video game mechanics but um it's like those like eerie spaces that feel like strangely nostalgic like um classrooms with the like panel ceilings and like bright fluorescent lights um and just like creepy spaces that like kind of just live in everybody's brain um but the idea is that like you are just like in a normal space and suddenly you turn and look and like there's a back room um or an entrance to a back room or you find yourself in a back room and there's like no escape is the idea and then there's like monsters or like levels to it that you can go to um i'm doing a terrible job of explaining it i think that the concept is really interesting and like i like the spookiness of it but um it's just not it's just again like falls into that like creepypasta um like that issue that with creepypasta where there's like just too much explanation and it loses any element of, like, horror or intrigue. That's something I like about SCP, because, like, that's a community thing where everybody, um, everybody, like, gets to contribute to it. Uh, and so, you know, very, greatly varying levels of quality, but at the same time, uh, the, the, their style of just 
you're not explaining why something does something, you're literally just describing something and what it does. That just leaves so much to the imagination of just like, why does this function this way? Why was it found where it was? And that's like all left up to your imagination. So even in the worst SCPs, it's still pretty, pretty spooky. Um, and it leaves room for it to not necessarily be scary, where you can, um, where you can, uh, where, where you can have ones that are just, like, silly. There's, like, a lot of them that are just, like, something oh. silly, or it'll be, um, something that seems super innocuous but is actually scary, like the... Uh, there's one where it's like a candy dish, and it says, take one. And if you take one, it's just normal candy. If you take another, something horrible will happen to you. And it changes every oh. time what it is. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, stuff like that. But I don't think, like... I find your... Because it's written like a government document that's just... Or like, sci like a scientific document that's been redacted where it's just describing it. So I... I it lets it be just what it is without having to necessarily explain the func the explain the mechanics just explains the functions right which like that's all i mean you know sometimes it works to have the explanation but i don't think like a lot of horror necessitates that or like the allegory of it is lost in the explanation which, like, coming back to old, it sounds like that's, like, the problem it falls into. Yeah, at, at least in the movie. The the graphic novel is definitely helped by not including that. Like, they, they, they hint at, like, oh, something... They, like, kind of find more evidence of, like, oh, is this what's happening? And they're, like, kind of figuring stuff out, but they never really figure out anything of substance by the end of the graphic novel. Mm -hmm. Um which I, I think definitely helps it. That's what the problem with Willy's Wonderland was. That movie could have been so much better because it it had the benefit of a really strong lead character and, like, a very, like, not super original concept, but an interesting concept. Um, but then they just went and they just did the whole exposition backstory of, like, this is what happened. It's, like psychopathic serial killers reincarnated as Chuck E. Cheese guys and it's like, okay I guess like, you didn't have to say that tale as old as time <laughs> oh, boy. here, I it will go to the tribal expansion oh, I was considering it and then I was like, no it's a toss not up now. not yet Early on, it's not, not too bad yet. because you can you can keep uh, one of the cards in your hand. But once it's in there, it's like it really cuts off your options. Room. I saw the second Escape Room movie. Oh yeah, I watched the trailer for that, but I didn't. Uh... Have you watched the first one yet? No, that was a big reason. Okay. Um, the way I found is best to describe it is uh, it's like if Saw, it's like all the creativity of the traps in Saw, without like a ton of gore. So it's like. It still has a lot of really cheesy acting. It still has like a really a lot of really convoluted traps and a lot of stuff where when you think about it too long, you're like, well, that doesn't actually make sense. Mm -hmm. But it's like it's still as entertaining in that way. And I'd say it's a lot better for squeamish people who would have wanted to get into Saw for the cool creative traps and effects and stuff, but couldn't handle the gore. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that is the perfect one that, for what I was going for. Yes. I don't know. It's interesting. I feel like if you, like, unpack really any movie, it's, like, pretty e 
quickly, pretty quickly you realize that, like, not many movies actually rely on, like, any kind of realism. Um, I mean, to some extent, but it's always, well, I guess that's the nature of, the, <laughs> of, like, like, why would you be telling the story if, like, the person just died? But sometimes the story is still worth telling. Um, I was just talking about this with someone, but... I rewatched Devil May Cry Baby again recently, and, like, that's the thing that I really like about it, is that it doesn't, like, hold back from, like, just facing the reality of the situation. Um, and I find that, like, I don't know. I find it very refreshing. Because uh, it gets old to see, like, the unlikeliest thing that could possibly happen happen every single time. But then again, like, why would you be telling that story if, yeah, the person just... There has to be a reason that that, that is the story that sticks out even if it's happened hundreds of times before and the only person that survived it. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, storytelling in general, it's like, it's, it's a form of abstraction, which is why I feel like the, like, you don't necessarily have to have complex stories or stories that necessarily make super logical sense, but having a, a deep thematic core at the very least like something that runs through the DNA of the story so that even if the events don't work out and don't make sense or won't hold up to scrutiny there is still that emotional core that people can, can relate to and you know will be able to move past. I think that's something that really worked with Star Wars, because, like, a lot of it was spectacle, but then it was also, like, this very simple, relatable story of someone who wanted more getting in over their head and going on this, this wild adventure. Like, a mm -hmm. at its core, the, the characters are just relatable and likable. You can understand where they're coming from. So, even if you didn't necessarily... Uh, even if, like, a lot of the events don't line up or don't make any sense compared to our real world, it's like, it doesn't matter as much because that's not really what it's about. Yeah. Did you, did you yeah, see? that's true. Well, cards. Oops. Um, hmm. There's all these Tarshan cards. But once I buy this, I'm not going to need any more Tarshan cards. Ah, and you already got the blue up there, so I can't even get that one right now. Um, <laughs> hmm. I guess I'll just... There, for now. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is really good. One thing I've been really um, looking at with storytelling lately, just because I've been looking so much at, at games, is um, emergent storytelling, which is something that you can't do as easily in a straight narrative, uh, like with um, movies or, or books. But in games, you can just kind of hint at things in a way that will let people fill in the gaps for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. the, the one that I've been getting into especially lately is Oath, which is my current favorite game, where it's this deeply thematic game with a super rich story spanning like centuries of war and turmoil, and there's not a single word of narrative written anywhere in the rule book, on the cards, any of that. It's fully, the narrative fully comes through with just how the game works out. So like, even though there's no, no dialogue, no plot, specifically anything, you can have stories. Like there was one where it was, it literally with how everything worked out in the game, it ended up with this, this one last battle in a hidden bastion in the middle of this, this forgotten mythical forest. One, one last attempt to protect an empire that was about to fall and just everything crumbling with one, one last battle. And it, it's, it's, was so 
beautiful and almost heartbreaking, and it was all purely from what the players did in the game. And it's it's hard to it's hard to explain, but like I streamed that game that where that happened specifically on here, and I remember like specifically like as soon as I thought of it, I was just like that is that is just like artful the way they, they yeah. were able to construct a game that could tell a story like that that could be so evocative without having to write any actual story a game that can tell stories unto itself which is something that like yeah that, that's really like part of the reason why i love games so much because that's one one way that this medium is unique um is unique to any other medium. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's fascinating. Um, I love that idea. There was another one. Yeah, it is like so. Oh, yeah. What? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you can go ahead. I was just going to give another example. Oh, I was just going to say, like, that's kind of, like, my favorite thing, that, like, organic communal creation of, like, uh, a story that, like, really means something. And it can be hard to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one thing I really liked about um, the Adventure Zone game we were playing, because it's it's definitely mm-hmm. designed to emulate a a like D and D tabletop RPG style of t- storytelling, but it was pretty well designed to to prompt you to do that um, pretty effortlessly, because it just it it basically just gave you a prompt to just come up with one sentence of the story but still yeah. gave you plenty of room to do whatever you wanted. Yeah, yeah, I really liked that game. Yeah, we should definitely It's definitely, I feel like it's a good, like, intro for somebody who's, like, interested in D&D, but overwhelmed by all the mechanics. Yes. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that that would be a good spot, of uh, a good place to start. And then there are some other indie RPGs that are, like, a, a, a lot more stripped down than like a D&D, where D&D is like so focused on having rules for any situation that could pop up in that fantasy world and like mm-hmm. I can totally appreciate the, the level of depth involved with that um, but also it's it's a little much yeah it can be really overwhelming um, but and I haven't even like played that much D&D, like, just what we had played. But I listen to a lot of D&D podcasts, but even that, like, no D&D podcast actually fully follows the rules of D&D. Yeah. Well, not no. Actually, I like the ones less that are, do more strictly, um, like, stick to the rules. Like, I don't like those ones as much. They get, like, lost in the cast. It just doesn't make for a great, like, um, podcast, like, as an audio format. I think, like, allowing themselves the freedom to kind of move out well, outside of those like strict parameters makes for a more interesting well, thing that's, to listen to. That's kind of one of the, the weaknesses weaknesses of D D itself is that D D was more inspired originally by war games, like the the risk style classic military strategy games. So it was so focused on the combat and like working on all of that that um, the actual role-playing side of it, despite being the main draw of the whole thing, was almost an afterthought. And, like, even leading up to 4th uh, edition, where the... Um, where it was basically just a war game entirely. Like, it, it was there were so many rules for combat, and it was so in-depth. And while, yeah, a lot of people really loved that, it was... It really threw role playing as a concept to the wayside, so um, I, I think that's pretty much why so many, so many podcasts sprouted up 
with fifth edition because they they looked and if you if you're into indie tabletop rpgs you know this they they clearly looked at specifically um what indie rpgs were doing and more or less stole a ton of the stuff from them like the mm -hmm. fact that now the character sheets include like what's your biggest goal in life you know what's what's your weakness like that's all stuff from like burning wheel and other indie rpgs because those are things that facilitate role playing it makes you think about your character it makes you actually think about your role in the world whereas before it was just like eh, play an elf because you want to be an elf but now it's like play this specific elf because you're inspired by what they're doing um so Similarly, because the combat mechanics became mostly spoken and you didn't need the grid as much, that made it better for uh, an audio format, and then uh, the fact that it did actually encourage a lot more role-playing. I'd say it's still not great. Um, a better example would be like Burning Wheel, where uh, you specifically have stats for things like... Um, what was the example? One of the examples was... Uh, you can spend a number of character creation points to know a specific character in the world, right? Like someone who's very powerful, like the king. But then you could spend less character creation points for them to know you because they hate you. Oh. Or like if you have a bonus in something, like if you're if one of your descriptions is like hairy, it's like that means you were so signi like significantly hairy to the point that you could like get bonuses trying to pose as a gorilla, basically. Oh, interesting. Like, th there were, there's no superfluous things. Your, like, your character's personality will come into play. Um, right. So, th things like that. Like, they, they, there are better forms of role-playing. And I think, I don't know, I, I'm a little overwhelmed by all the D&D podcasts. Because, like, the, the main, there's the main two, which are Taz... And um, uh, Critical Role, which I I haven't listened to Critical Role. Their their big I gimmick like is. I don't like it that much. No. No. Yeah. It's one of those that I think sticks to. I don't know. I find it very overwhelming. I think that having so many people playing. Mm -hmm. Um. Which is ironic just... because yeah, that's how many people are supposed to play. They don't recommend having a small party. I know, but it works so much better for the format, like an audio format. It's much easier to follow for me because there's so many things happening and people talk over one another. And like, I feel like four or fewer. Yeah. Is good, but um, I like. I mean, I listen to quite a few, um, and. My, uh, well, I listen to, to The Adventures, and of course I do, but um, I really like uh, that it's not The Adventure Zone. There's a newer one um, called Unprepared Casters, and they do shorter, so there's two people who host, and they switch off uh, DMing because they do shorter arcs. Um, they're typically no longer than six episodes, and um, they have like different people come in and play every time, but it's like in this within the same like world so the stories are connected in like small ways like you'll see past characters like come in and it's an interesting way to see like the growth of these characters um but also like they do a really good job of fleshing out the story and the characters in such a small amount of time um like the playthroughs are really engaging it's just it's a lot of fun like all the characters have been great so far the last arc they just did was absolutely my favorite. Um, I think it's certainly worth listening to. It's pretty short, too. And, like, the nice thing is, like, you can start on any of the arcs. Like, you don't have to listen to it all the way through. Um, so I, I find that one to be, like, much less overwhelming than, like, the really big campaigns that are, like, 50, 60 episodes, hours and hours of listening to them. Okay. Uh -huh. What was that one called? And uh, unprepared casters. Okay. There's one, I mean, it's, it doesn't sound like you need recommendations, but there was one I was liking for a while, uh, called Bombardment. 
Oh, I don't know that one. It's, um, it, they, on, like, early Adventure Zone, before they went back and, like, re-recorded a bunch of the promotions, it was, like, promoted on there a lot. And the idea okay. is that it's a party of bards, like, all bards who are going to a bard school played by an actual, like, real-life band, and every episode they make a song relevant to the episode. Oh my god, that's wonderful. It's really, really fun. Um, I yeah, just got, I I got like so overwhelmed by have... all of the D&D stuff, so I had to kind yeah. of, I have to just stick to Taz. That's the only one that I, like, have the attention span for. Games that have, oh, sorry, games that have, like, um, fall into those, like, kind of strange niches, I guess, are, like, some of my favorites. Like, I really like Dungeons and Daddies. And it's like pretty blue, <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's really funny. But it definitely leads like further into comedy than like even like D and D. But the premise is that it's a bunch of soccer dads who are driving to their kids to a soccer game, and they get they like fall through a portal into the um, forgotten realms, and they have to save their their sons are kidnapped and they have to save their sons. That's and, really uh, good. It makes me like, think of Hello from the Magic pretty... Tavern. Oh, I don't know. Oh, hello. Okay, Hello from the Magic Tavern. It's not, um, it's not a D and D one, but it's about a guy from like the Midwest somewhere who fell through a portal behind the Burger King into a fantasy world, and he just barely is getting Wi-Fi through the portal. So he's doing a podcast from a tavern in this fantasy world, and he'll just like invite in whoever's there. So, like, a lost prince who's pretending that he's not actually a prince very poorly. Or, like, the shapeshifter oh who lives there. And it's it's really funny. It's kind of like MST3K humor, um, okay. which I, I, I really appreciate. Uh, it's Hello from the Magic Portal, is that what it's Hello called? from the Magic Tavern. Tavern, okay. I'll, the episodes I'll are pretty short, that. so... Um, Kind of just have to do travel that's what it here. that also reminds me of that show that i was just telling you about pretty recently the um the midnight gospel it's like not mm. it, the premise isn't like that really but um similar in this idea of like going to alternate realities i guess and like interviewing people there yeah in like a podcast format The big thing with D&D podcasts is that it feel it's it's kind of taken over from what was just ge like the the top podcast genres which were talking about bad movies which was most of them um talking about music less and then general topic which is to say me and my friends are just going to talk about whatever because we always have fun having conversations and I'll, I'll tell you guys right now that is the the worst kind of podcast the only time they ever get listens is if it's a celebrity if it's some kind of celebrity people will listen for a while because they'll be like well i wonder what the celebrity has to say but then it's just like it's just it's not that interesting most times um but now D&D &D podcasts with 5th edition, because it's so easy to do that over podcasts, it, it got really overwhelmed, especially by comedians doing it. And so often it just devolves into this thing of like, wow, we're just doing modern world stuff, which Taz does a lot um, mm -hmm. as well. But like, it's, it's really kind of obnoxious after a while that all of them, it's like, hey, we're just going to... We're, we're just going to fan fantasy Burger King or something. Like, the, it's the laziness at a certain point. I, it's also that a lot of the people who do those kinds of podcasts aren't nearly as funny as the McElroys. Yeah. So it just ends up not working in the same way. I think, like, there is, like, a certain rapport that people have to have. That even if you have a good rapport with someone, it might not be the right one for that like format like just because you're good like you have good or funny conversations with someone doesn't mean that like other people will think that those conversations are good and funny yeah 
Yeah, that's the that's that's one of the big things. Um, like I think the worst one I ever like ended up being a part of was there was just a random casting call. It's like I want to do this podcast called Just Talking, and it was literally just like getting random people together who had never spoken to do a general topic podcast and the guy literally had no idea for what like any segments or anything he was basically offloading all of the work to us to like figure out what the show was gonna be and it's like why how why is this even your show at this point considering we've done all of the work and like why would anybody listen to this we're like a bunch of random people from a casting website who are just all awkwardly talking for the first time ever. Like, we've literally never spoken before we're recording this podcast. It was a terrible <laughs> idea. Yeah, that's hard. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, hmm. Let's see. What am I doing? Okay, um, hmm. Okay. Okay, I think I have a game. Wait, no, that's not what I needed. Ah, oh, frick, I might have messed that up. Uh oh. Oh well. Well, so far, probably it won't be like this for me always, but I kind of have to just figure out how to play it as I go, and I like games like that, for me personally. Maybe yeah. because it also, like, takes pressure away from, um, of, like, like competition, necessarily. Yeah. I don't know. That's a, a, I like, like I being competitive, but also it's overwhelming that, that's the big thing with like video games is that the, some of the best video games are ones where it's very cleverly designed so that they can teach you how to play it just by presenting you with situations where you're gonna do the things you need to learn um, like Super Mario Brothers originally like it, there's been a million analyses of like the first level of that and how it's directly designed to teach you everything about moving jumping you know running getting the mushrooms, what's an enemy, like all of those things it teaches you in like the first half of the first level without ever having to say anything. Um, It's really difficult to do that with board games because you have to make sure that you're not messing up, but by doing it digitally like this, you get the opportunity to learn the game like that. Because if you Mm -hmm. try and do something that's wrong, the game just won't let you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we got the other side. Uh, Pepper. Goodbye, Pepper. Bye. Bye. And I finished my Dr. Pepper just as we're saying that. What? Serendipity. I don't remember the last one. But you said Dr. Pepper and I could taste it. Yeah, I like, I mean, it is the best soda, but I can, I can't really do soda that much. Just cause like, at this point, my sugar tolerance is just way too high to, or rather way too low to be able to handle a full can of soda. But, those are the ones that come in the little mini cans. So one of those is perfect. Oh, nice. I love those mini cans. They're so cute. Yeah. They don't have any of like the wacky flavors though. It's all the basic like Coke, Diet Coke, Mountain Dew, whatever. Mm-hmm. 
but it has Dr. Pepper, and that's the only one I care about anyways. I guess maybe like Baja Blast, but that's only like limited time anyways. Yeah, I've never had a Baja Blast. It's pretty good. It's just like extra lime flavor, Mountain Dew. should actually get, hmm, that one? Maybe? Is that worth it? I hope so. I think they'll work out. Maybe. I don't know. thing I really like about this game is the action selection, because there's like a ton of worker placement games where um, you'll just have a bunch of different slots that have different actions, and so if somebody picks one of those actions, then no one else can do it. But with this, it's like you can only pick the ones on the edges and then try and get the ones in the middle, so you have to so more... It has to be so much more strategic to try and, like, block your opponent from getting the action they want, but also still get the ones that you want. And, like, there's so much limited time with this robber going around. It's, like, it's, it's a very puzzle, puzzle-type game. And it really, it really, it really makes you think. <laughs> Wait, what game? This game. This game? The this one we game. Playing, okay. Party. Yeah. I don't know why I was so confused. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. There's another one. What was I thinking? Right. There's one, uh, Puerto Rico. I think we played that one time, and I didn't explain it very well. We did play that one time. Yeah, that's a, f a favorite of mine as well. But, um. It's. It's a lot longer, and it's it's a little too hard to explain um, in this format. I'd basically have to make like the the video like I did for this, or uh, just like get an actual physical copy for whenever I come visit family next. But I have no idea when that'll be. Yeah, I know, right? People couldn't follow the rules. I want to go out, get out of the city. Hmm. Oh, an action to perform. How many do you have? Two. All the dates beans in my head. Same. They look like beans. They look like beans. Especially, I got a physical copy of this and I finally got to play it once the other day. And like, I still was consistently saying beans every time. Even though it's a beans. lot more obvious, <laughs> on, on the full-size cards, it's a lot more obvious that they're dates. But, like, from this slightly zoomed-out perspective, it's like, that just looks like a bowl of baked beans. I love a bowl of baked beans. Can do this one? Right? Yes, I got enough. Um, what are those? I like that candy, too. The baked beans candy that's, like, the candy-coated peanuts. Oh, yeah, the Boston baked beans. Yeah, yeah. They're a little too crunchy for me now, I think, but... Maybe. I always preferred the, um... The sensitive the, the burnt peanuts? The ones that are, like, all knobbly? Mm hmm Which is, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing, it's just a different texture. It's like... 
don't know, something about the texture of those ones is a little, a little more pleasant to me. And I Slots. What to put in them? Hmm. Got at least. I forgot about the slots until very recently, so I'm not doing well on that. Front. That's the camel rider card I was thinking of. Okay. And was it? I think that one got put in recently. I don't know. Um. Yeah. I... It's real easy when you first start playing this game. No. Ah, you blocked me. Okay. Um. I will just go for the coin, man. Yeah, it's really easy to forget the slots when playing in this mode because they're, like, tucked down underneath. But, like, that's kind of the whole focus of the game. So... I know. I, I think it's it's why a lot of people playing this game for the first time are just like, I can't win. Because it's, like, it's pretty tight. There's only, uh... There's only, like... 12 turns total before the end of the game. Um, so, like, you basically have to get at least one card every turn into there, or, like, set up to do two in a future turn if you want to be able to fill it in. Right. Also, my physical copy that I got, I didn't, it didn't come with the, the, the robber meeple. Oh. Like, they just forgot weird. it in my copy, so I had to email them. And they're, sh they're shipping me one for free, which is cool, but, like, it's just very odd to have, like, a, like, essential part of the game missing. Mm -hmm. Out of my almost 100 games, though, that's, like... I think the second time there's been a piece missing, so that's that's a pretty good track record for the, the game industry as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. They're doing their job. They're doing their best. It's prices for like making and shipping games has like skyrocketed lately. And a lot of, like, Kickstarters are getting kind of screwed over. Because they, they had budgeted for the prices when they started the campaign, like, prior to Pandemic. And now, like, they're still trying to get stuff shipped out and everything. It's, uh, it's pretty hectic. Still waiting on the Stardew Valley board game to go back in stock, too. Yeah, I didn't know. Well, I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised by the board games that exist. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I like, they're, they're going on, like, a whole massive spree of just, like, adapting every sort of, um, every existing property out there at this point. Um, so, like, there's a Space Invaders board game now... Uh, I have the Minecraft board game. That one's actually really good. Uh, I have, like, a Scooby-Doo board game that's pretty fun. Mainly because it's just, like, the Scooby-Doo version of Betrayal at House on the Hill. Mm -hmm. Which is a very oh, fun cool. kind of explore the spooky house game. Mm -hmm. What else? Oh, there's just a ton. Um, some Godzilla board games. There's a Haunted Mansion board game, like Disney's Haunted Mansion. Oh, that, one, that makes sense. That one I have not gotten yet, but I, I, I want to at some point. There's even, there's a Monster Crunch, like the Count Chocula gang. There's a Monster Crunch board game. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, I got that one. It's an okay game. It's kind of, um, it's kind of like President, if you know that card game, which is kind of like War, sort of, mm -hmm. not really. Uh, it's okay, but I, I mostly got it just because the artwork is so cute. It's like the, the like, super 70s looking versions of them, 70s, I think. I mean, it looks 70s. It might be from the 80s. I don't know how old Count Chocula is. 
Um, yeah, I don't either. And it has the two the two lost members of the gang, Fruity Yummy Mummy and Fruit Brute. Oh, cute. Uh, yeah, I should play that again. I just need to have a game night sometime soon. It's just like most of the games either require three players or just better at three players and Corey's been working so much lately that it's usually just me and Coco hanging out. Yeah. Although this game is I, I have this physically now and it's a pretty fun two player game. Mm -hmm. What I really want to play is the Dune board game, but that one is like only really fun at like four or more players. Oh. That one, it was like in the that. 80s, it was like the most complicated but like actually well designed board games to come out in that era. Um, like it's not perfect, but as far as like games from that decade go, it's like incredible. And they finally re-released it after years of being out of print. And it's it's pretty fun. The Dune board game? Yeah, it's very thematic though. Like it, everything in it is like very specifically designed to like match up with the, the Dune universe. Oh no. Right, I got the tent card that means you can only play two this turn. So rude. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was out you could have gotten it too. That strategy. Yeah, the big thing with the Dune board game is that um there's like every turn you like flip the this deck like you you take out one card to see where the spice ends up but there's a bunch of sandworm cards in there and when the sandworm happens first off it eats all the spice there and whatever like guys you had on the map on that space but once that happens a nexus happens and everybody around the board is allowed to basically negotiate and team up and you all have like really powerful like special powers like the Harkonnen every time they like kill somebody else's guy they get a guy and like the um like the the Bene Gesserit like they when you do battles they literally get to tell you like you have to do this thing that I tell you right now like oh. just like super like powerful stuff and when you team up with someone you get like a weakened version of their power on top of yours that's interesting mm -hmm. I'm honestly i'm super excited for the dune movie it's coming out um pretty soon yeah i never got into dune um I, I've had the book for a while and I still haven't read it, but I've been meaning to. I really like the David Lynch movie. It's not good, but like I just love something about just like how how deep the lore is. It's it's sci-fi, mm -hmm. but it's definitely like sci-fi fantasy. Like it's it has that heavy like political edge to it and like the millions of pages of lore that's like practically a bible for a world that doesn't exist so like it's it's really fun for that kind of stuff right that makes sense yeah and the, the casting in the new one looks really good like I, i'm really surprised at just how um well cast oscar isaacs as uh, Timothy Chalamet's character's dad works out. Like, they're a great father-son casting. Hmm. I, like, just saw the trailer, but I don't remember it. I should watch it again. Yeah. Hmm? Exactly. 
Oh, right. I thought I had something there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's... It mainly just gets me excited because it looks like competent directing and, like... Like, not that David Lynch is a bad director. He's just not a good, like, big sci-fi action director. So it was just not the right project for him. Um... So, like, seeing how uh, Denis Villeneuve is going to do it, like, it, it gets me excited. Cause I, especially considering, like, how specifically against the formula his movies always end up being, I'm real curious to see how he handles the material. Wow. I win. I like a lot. Um, yeah, I, absolutely. I, I play this game a lot, so <laughs> sorry for kind of crushing you. Oh, no, it's fine. I, like, th really didn't know what I was doing, so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of did. I pieced it together. By the end, I felt like I, like, really knew what was going on, but, like, there was a while there where I was just, like, pushing buttons. That's about <laughs> how I played when I first started playing this. Like, I had a, a general idea of what I was meant to do, but it wasn't until halfway through the game that I even had a strategy, and by that point, like, my opponent was just completely bulldozering over everything I had planned. Let's finish off with some Kala. Alright, game. Play a few games of that. Classic. I really the point though. Oh, that's where you can like um take opponents first move and change sides of the board. Empty capture, yes. Yeah. Not that. Yeah. Oh, you can change the number of uh, stones in each hole. Well, let's let's change that. Let's do six stones to a hole. See how that plays out. Oink games would do, um, do board game arena. I think it, their games would work really well with this platform, but they just they haven't yet. What? They haven't what? Sorry. Uh, Oink games. Like they, they are a Japanese developer that makes all these games in like these super tiny boxes. Um. And, like, not all of them are great, but most of them are really good. And they're, they're developing their own app now that's going to be on, like, Nintendo Switch and phones and everything. But I, I wish they just put some of their games on here. Because this would work really well for a lot of them. Um, like, uh, what, what is uh the, their biggest one is Fake Artist Goes to New York, which is a drawing game, but it's a drawing like, hidden role game, where basically, uh, there's one person who's the game master, and they decide a category, and then they write down something that's in that category, so if it's, like, food, they could write down cheese, um, oh. but they write it down on all these little cards, except for one card that says fake, then everybody else draws those and looks at them secretly, so one person doesn't know what we're drawing, everybody else knows that it's cheese, then, on your turn, you have to draw a single line. So once you lift up your pen, your turn's over. But you draw a single line to add to the drawing to convince everyone else that you know what you're drawing. But if the fake artist figures out what you're drawing, everybody loses. So you're, you're trying to bluff that you know what you're drawing without giving it away. And at the end, you all vote on who you think the fake artist is. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, there's a lot of games like that. Yeah. But it's fun to hear, like, it sounds like that's a, the art as an approach sounds really fun. Yep. Yeah, it is it is just, like, a werewolf or whatever, but, like, that's, that particular aspect of the art really adds a great deal to it. Um, and then, like, their next biggest is Deep Sea Adventure, where you're just, like, Not 
like that. Mm. That, I guess? Yeah. Um, uh, with Deep Sea Adventure, it's basically you are all treasure divers that are sharing an air tank. And as you go down, um, you don't use up any air, but once you pick up a treasure, for every treasure you pick up, the air goes down by that much. And so, you basically are trying to push your luck to see, like, how far can I go, how much treasure can I pick up, to be able to get back in time before we run out of air. Because also, however much treasure you're picking up, any time you move, like you roll the die, they subtract how much treasure you picked up from your die roll. So if you pick up, like, three or more on, you know, a maximum of six that you can move, you're going to end up moving half. And, like, half of the time you won't move at all. And the air is constantly going down by three on your turn and more on everybody else's turns. Oh, my God, that's so stressful. Oh, it's super fun. It's, su it's super fun because it's just, like, how, how deep can I go? Can I trust everybody else, you know, to not use up too much air? And, like, am I going to get enough roll? It's, like, it's, like, very gambly and a very fun one. Ah, crap! Why did I give that to you? <laughs> oh, I forgot how this game works. Okay. Um. And then my favorite, Startups, is a card game where you have three cards. There's, like, six different companies in the deck that all have a bunch of different, like, each one is, like, a different number of cards in the deck. And and when um, on your turn, you can either take a card from the deck or take one that somebody's put out that they don't want, and you gotta pay if you want to take from the deck. But um, you can also play a card right in front of you, and that just confirms that like I am investing in this company. And at the end, whoever invested the most in a company gets uh, gets money from everybody who invested less in that company. So it's basically like just trying to figure out like, okay, how many are in the deck? How many does everybody around me have? And like, how many are people hiding? Because at the end, whatever three are in your hand also get invested. So someone could only have one invested on the table, but then they have a three more of them in their hand, so they actually did have the most and are going to be able to take all of that away from you. It's it's kinda hard to describe without having it in front of you, but it's like it's super simple. You just like take a card, put a card down, but which card you take and which one you put down and where basically determines all of this so it's like kind of bluffing kind of like just general set collection push your luck stuff it's really mm -hmm. really fun okay interesting yeah i'm definitely whenever i visit next i'm gonna bring that one because it's just it's i mean it's one of my favorite games in general and it's like it's so tiny that like you can fit it in like the smallest like you can fit it in your pants pocket basically so I'm probably just gonna bring all of my Oink games because I only have like three, or no, I have five of them because of that Kickstarter. But even then, like I'm five sweet. of them, like take up less space than any other board game. That's nice. Yeah, that's the thing about board games is they like take up a lot of space. I was gonna watch your stream where you organized them, but I wasn't able and didn't end up being able to being able to catch it. How I can link you to the, uh, the I, I put them all up on YouTube after the fact, so I can link you to that one. Oh, cool, yeah. I actually have your YouTube up on my TV right now. Yeah, I found, so um, well, I have a different channel for that, just so that it can be, like, basically oh. an archive. Because Twitch, they do save some streams, but only, like, the last two months worth. So I wanted to make sure that they were all archived somewhere. Um, but yeah, in that stream, I, like, I specifically found these, like, fabric boxes on, um, on Amazon that are specifically 16 inches at their longest point, 
which is the longest that board games are. Like, Monopoly is 16 inches long, so that means that I'm able to put, like, all of the longest board games I have, like Monopoly, Risk, another version of Monopoly, into the boxes, like, sideways, so that I can just, like, pull them out like a book. then I have a bunch of like card games and like point games and stuff that all fit into like a super tiny little uh, fabric box. Um, one of the ones that I'm always going back and forth on is I have a collar board that's like the folding kind, but I'm always nervous that it's gonna like pop open because it doesn't have a clasp or anything. So I still keep it in the box, even though that makes it, like, so much bulkier. Mm. I feel like I could probably think that out better, but... I don't know. I'm, I'm always nervous about my board games, because I store most of them on their side. I'm always nervous about them, like, popping open in storage. Right. So far, none of them have. I've had some that get pretty loose, but, like, none that, like, pop have fully popped open. Mm, that might have been a bad move. That is nerve-wracking. I mean, there's so many, like, pieces involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, is that, like, now they're like, all... as kids, it's like, we couldn't hang on to board games or anything. I know, yeah. I was always... Th I've been thinking about stuff like that. Like, at some point we got, um, the D&D Red Box, where it was just, like, a... It was, like, a starter kit that came with, like, dungeon tiles and miniatures and, like, the whole rule book and everything. Um, and we ended up never using it, but I really regret that. I wish we had, like, tried that out. Yeah. Well, we I had, know. Like, Lord, I Lord of didn't the Rings even know Risk. that we had that. What? Yeah, yeah, when we um, lived in, like, Addy, we had a copy of Lord of the Rings Risk. Oh my god. Which, I mean, it's still Risk, but it was, like, you know, all the all the areas in Middle-earth and everything. Mm -hmm. All my stuff is in, like, fabric, like, fabric storage cubes now, so even if they were to pop open, they'd all stay more or less contained. But at the same time, I'm so paranoid about, like, I, I just want to keep my board games nice. Because that was another thing, is that when we were kids, our board games would never stay nice. And we'd always, like, you know, somebody would step on the lid and, like, snap one of the corners open. We'd lose pieces. The, pe the like, Monopoly money would get all crumpled up. Oh, that was not what I was planning I think you're gonna win. This. I know puzzles would never, would never survive. I know there was. I remember when we lived in like um, the hunter's house. We mom had that like big fish puzzle that was like a fishing village scene that like blended into a fish, and the whole thing was shaped like a fish that was like never finished. But mm -hmm. like that was just always out on a table for like years. No, it got finished, and we glued it, get? it together. Okay. Yeah. Because it was like, I, like, decided to finish it, and then Mom bought glue so I could glue it back together. Okay. I don't think we ever did anything with it after that. Yeah. Also, it, like, never made sense to me why we glued it together. Like, that's just not a thing that I do with puzzles. Um, Coco and I did that. We... We've been trying to get into puzzles. We did, like, a big uh, Animal Crossing one that took, like, a few days. It was, like, an, a thousand piece. And, like, by the time we were done with it, we were just, like, proud enough that we decided to, like, glue it and frame it. So now it's in our living room. Right. <laughs> we also got um, the people who made the Taz board game we played also made a couple of jigsaw puzzles. Uh, one of the Moon Base and one of the Fantasy Costco. I got those, and we've been planning on doing them, but we have not, we have not cracked into them yet. Yeah, I just bought a puzzle, and I haven't started it at all, but, um... Uh... 
but it's waiting for me when I'm ready for it. I spend a lot of time on puzzles. Like, I don't, like, just do them in, like, one sitting. Obviously, nobody really, like, people do, but not me. But. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what, what we'll do is we'll pull out, like, a folding table. And it's basically just a fixture. So we have, like, we're fortunate enough that we have enough space that we can just kind of, like, push it to the side, out of the way. And then, like, whenever we have a few minutes, you know, like, we're waiting for somebody to get ready so we can go do something, like, groceries or whatever, or, like, if we're just, like, watching YouTube or, like, nothing, something that doesn't require your hands, like a video game, uh, we'll just, like, you know, do a few pieces. Or, like, just as you're walking by, just kind of look like, uh, there's a piece. Like, that, that feels like the, the best way to do it. Yeah. I, like, do it, I find it to be a very meditative thing when I can, like, get myself into it, but, like, I don't really have the space for it right now. That's so, a big thing, yeah. Well, I kind of do, but I'd have to clean off my table. Yeah, we have a bunch of folding tables for pretty much, pretty much that reason and, like, I don't know, having uh, having temporary surfaces feels so much more convenient because it means that when you're not using them, you have so much more space, but whenever you need them, they're there for you. Oh, what yeah. the heck? Uh, no, I'm taking that first move. We're switching sides. Good. <laughs> That's what happens. Oh no, you're gonna... Ah! <laughs> oh shoot I could have done that to you if I had thought that through oh boy this is going to be a very short game with only three stones per hole I know oh yeah it's going to go so fast yeah that's a big thing in board games too is like how long they take that's something I love about Kala is like I can mm -hmm. it, it takes literally like two seconds to explain the rules and it takes like at most like 10 minutes to play a game. So like it's it's a great game to introduce to pretty much anybody. But then there's like the games I like, like Oath or like the Dune board game, or it's like, okay, it's gonna take like 40 minutes to explain the rules and you're probably not gonna understand most of them until you actually do them. So just kind of trust me and it's like, I can, I can guarantee if you get into it, those are amazing games, but the actual, like, investment of time and energy just to, like, get started with them, it's a lot to ask. So I totally understand people, like, getting overwhelmed by stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Alright, um, five, yes, one. No! It's mine! Oh. Um... I must so protect. So rude. Mm, mm, there. Bam, protected. What are you even gonna do about it? I know, there's nothing. I'm gonna have to hit, hit you with that six eventually, but... Not today. Oh, now it's an eight. Will that loop all the way around? I think it will by one. Right. Yes. Oh, I don't even have any on my board now. So that, that's all you. I know. Here it goes. Yeah, I think the sweet spot is a game that takes less than an hour. Uh, it takes less than ten minutes to teach. Oh, perfect tie. tie. Oh, we gotta do a rematch. We need a tiebreaker on that. That um, is not our first tie on this game. Yeah. I mean, we've played it a lot, like, lifetime. That's true. Um, but yeah, the sweet spot is a game that takes, like, less than 10 minutes to teach and less than an hour to play. But a lot of that comes down to, like, how quickly people will take their turns. I've grown very adept at, even if I don't fully understand a game, just taking my turn really fast to try and learn it faster. Yeah, I feel like that's, like, my go, because it doesn't really, like, 
you're not gonna like figure it out just by staring at the board so might as well just like do what you think you can do and yeah. correct on, as you go like every everybody else there will be happier with you because you're not holding up the game you'll learn the game a lot faster because you'll be able to get more like like um you'll get more feedback quicker just from like playing quicker and like in general if you don't understand the game you also are unlikely to understand what decisions are arbitrary and you should just take randomly so by just taking them randomly you quickly learn like okay that didn't affect anything when i took that randomly so that must it must not actually matter that much what my decision is whereas taking that randomly actually screwed me over later so now i know that it is an important decision Carcassonne. Carcassonne is the one that I would introduce most people to board games with because it takes very little time to explain and like anybody I've explained it to, no matter like what level of experience they have board games with, whether they're just like the average person who's only played like Monopoly or someone who's like super into the idea of board games, like everybody's able to grasp it pretty well and have a really fun time with it. I think a big part of that also comes down to your turns are really short because you just place a tile, maybe place a meeple, and because there's not very much busy work. Whereas like a lot of games you'll have to do a bunch of housekeeping, it's like okay because you did that we have to move all of these things to keep track of stuff. There's none of that in Carcassonne, it's just like you take your turn and um, you take your turn and just move straight to the next person's turn really quick. Right. And it's fun. Yes. it's Yeah, it's one of those ones like Uno for me, where even though I am pretty much, like, I've pretty much mastered those games, I don't think I'm ever going to get any better at them, uh, I still don't mind playing them, because, like, they're quick, and they're still just entertaining enough that I don't, I don't get too bored with them. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, the one that most people get introduced to to like Euro games and other like deeper board games with is uh, Settlers of Catan, which is kind of a bad one yeah. for for introducing people because it's it's a little complicated. The turns take a while, and like you have to do some long term strategy, um, and it has unbounded trading, just like Monopoly, how you can trade the properties. It's like you can trade any of your resources in Catan, but a lot of people are terrible at recognizing when no one wants to trade with them, and they just, like, waste so much time with it. Yeah. Yeah, in general, I've never I... played Settlers of Catan. You haven't played that one? Mm -mm. I don't think it's on here, because I think it has its own website. Uh, no! Oh. oh, I missed that one. Ah, uh, you're gonna win this one. Um, it's okay. It's it's one where I've definitely played it enough to exhaust my interest in it. And like, yeah, yeah, it's like the trading is is like the big draw to it, but it's also like really bad for strategy. Like you're you don't trade in Catan. Ah, yeah, you won. You don't trade in Catan unless you're screwing someone over, so people at a high level playing it just don't trade. But trading is the fun part, because you're doing like bargaining and all sorts of haggling and stuff. So, yeah, that's it. I don't know. I, I feel like trading in a game should only be there if it's specifically the focus of the game. Right. Like, if, if that is the main mechanic, and they're like very specific about how trading works, Rather than games like Monopoly or Catan, where it's just like, you can trade stuff anytime on your turn, you figure it out. Because then people just take way too long trying to. Or they just, like, don't do it. Like, I feel like trading isn't something yeah. that was uh, has ever been on the forefront of my mind with like, something like Monopoly. I know, 
know. Well, that's the thing is, like, valuation can be really hard. So, like, very often in those games, people don't really get what stuff is worth. Um, which is why games like uh, uh, QE, which stands... Uh, what does it stand? Uh, quantitative easing is really fun. It's basically a game where you're you're bidding, you're doing, like, a, like silent auction, basically. Um, but it's all hidden. Like, you all decide, and then you reveal, and then whoever bid the most, uh, whoever bid the most gets the thing. So that's, like, the whole game is just bidding. But you basically get to bid whatever you want. You can bid 50 billion. Like, if you oh. want to. Uh, but you might not want to because at the end of the game, whoever spent the most, no matter how many other points they have, they automatically lose. So it's basically whoever spent the second most while still having the most points that they got from winning the auctions. So it's a game purely about valuation in a way that, like, makes it very clear, you know, like, the, the whole thing is about learning to evaluate, basically, through actually doing it. Mm -hmm. So that, that makes it fun. All right. Uh, do you want to play anything else? Or we're at about two hours now. I think that I think that makes a good stream, but we can keep going. Yeah, I think I need to like, go eat lunch. Um, oh yeah, it's like it's like four your time, right? No, it's like two thirty. It's not that late. Right, right. I have the the um twenty four hour clock, so I thought it was. I I got that wrong. I thought it was like seven. It is only five here. Yeah, I'm happy to still chat, but probably not. I don't want to be cooking on the street. Yeah, honestly, I should go make dinner in a minute. Yeah. I was going to watch some movies with Coco. Well, okay, uh, I am going to do my outro for the stream, and then I will be right back with you, Egan, in just a minute. Sounds good. All right, that was a pretty fun one. Um, you know, as always, whoops, as always with, you know, a stream where you're bringing in someone remotely through Discord or something, audio wasn't great, but whatever. I hope you guys didn't mind too much. I hope you had fun listening to the conversation and, and watching the games. I uh, hope you'll tune in for another stream another time soon, um, tomorrow. Yeah, I'll do more Link's Awakening tomorrow, so tune in for that. Um, in the meantime, I want to thank you very much for inviting me into your home, your computer, your tablet, laptop, gaming console, Roku, Apple TV, however it is you watch today. I hope you had a very fun time. I hope you'll join me for my stream tomorrow of Link's Awakening. I hope you'll follow and subscribe. Please use your Twitch Prime sub, which if you have Amazon Prime, just link them up and you get a free sub every month. I'd appreciate it if you considered using that on my stream. Follow me on Twitter at IggyDKid. Follow me on YouTube Iggy and the Ape. Check out all of my past streams on Iggy Kid Twitch Archive. That's three words. Iggy Kid Twitch Archive. Um, all my past streams, including this one, just a few minutes after I finish it up. And yeah, those are all linked down below in the browser version. You can check out my schedule and stuff. All of that fun stuff. So thank you once again for watching. And hey, if nobody else has told you this, I'll tell you this. You're a good kid. Thanks for watching. Let me see if there's anybody online to raid you guys over to let's let's see here I, i'll actually go well you guys don't need to see my uh my screen here so let's see come on come on come on come on it's loading i just need to see who's online uh who's streaming right now Anybody, anybody I know. They think I'll like, get out of here, Amaranth. She keeps doing these weird like licking mics streams. I don't want that. Okay, doesn't look like there's anybody. Well, thanks for watching everybody. Have a good night. Goodbye.